The title of Paul's lecture today is Why World Peace is Possible. We're truly delighted to have Paul with us today, and I invite you to join me in a very warm Chautauqua welcome for Paul K. Chappelle. Thank you very much for being here. Can all of you hear me clearly? All right, thank you for being here. I'm very grateful to be able to speak with all of you. I'd like to begin today by talking about a controversial issue. And the controversial issue that I want to discuss today is hope. With all the... It's quite controversial, actually. If you think about all the bad things going on around in our world today, right? In our country and around the country. And have you felt your hope being challenged today by events happening in our country and around the world? Have any of you felt your hope being challenged today? So one thing I want you to get from this talk is I want you to feel a lot more hopeful about the world, but I want your hope to be based on reality. So I want to talk about some reasons why we should have realistic hope. So in 1958, only 4% of Americans approved of interracial marriage between blacks and whites. Only 4%. Today, 87% of Americans approve of interracial marriage between blacks and whites. So it's gone from 4 to 87% in one human lifetime. That's a dramatic change, I think, in one human lifetime. And I'm living proof of that change in attitude. My mother's Korean, my father's half white and half black, and I grew up in Alabama, so I'm living proof of that attitude has changed. <laughs> And since I was a child, both my parents always told me the only place in America where a black man has a fair chance is in the army. My father was born in 1925. He had me when he was 54 years old. And his reality was being a black man in the South, in Virginia, under segregation during the Great Depression, he had more opportunity in the military than he had in other sectors of American society. Keep in mind, the military had desegregated prior to the major civil rights victories. And something a lot of people don't know is that one of the things that influenced Rosa Parks was Rosa Parks worked in the military base. And on the military base, there was no segregation, and when she would leave the military base, she would see segregation. So that's one reason why I went to West Point and why I went to the Army. My parents thought that because I look Asian and I'm part black that I would have limited opportunity. And they thought that the military would accept me despite my diverse racial background. And my parents were very worried about me when I was growing up because I grew up as a racial outcast. I didn't fit into the black community because I don't look black. I didn't fit into the Asian community because my mother had married a black man. I didn't fit into the white community because I don't look white. So my parents were very worried about me. So I told my mother in 2009 I was getting out of the army and I told her over the phone and she was just screaming at me in the phone, just screaming at me. She said, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? She said, no one's going to give you a job. No one's going to hire you. She said, it's bad enough you look Asian, but you're also part black. She said, who's going to give a job to a black man who looks Asian? <laughs> so those are my parents' fears, but things have changed. Progress has happened. The world is far from perfect today, but there has been some progress. I'd much rather look Asian and be part black in 2016 rather than in 1916 or 1816. So if we made some progress, why can't we make more progress? If we made some progress, why can't we make more progress? So what are some other issues where there's been progress? What are some other issues where things have gotten better? Things might not be perfect, but again, if we made some progress, why can't we make more progress? So I want to talk about some issues where there's been dramatic change. Change that is so dramatic that many people don't even remember or realize how bad and how different things used to be. And I want to talk about this dramatic change by doing some role-playing scenarios. The first role-playing scenario I want to do is I want you to imagine that you travel back in time to the year 1200, to England, and you're talking to a group of English people in the year 1200. And you'll role-play the time traveler going back to the year 1200. I'll role-play the group of English people in the year 1200. And your mission, your purpose, is to convince them that all white men should have the right to vote. Now keep in mind, in the year 1200, People in Europe don't know what white people are. So you have to first explain to them what white people are. Then you have to try to convince them that all white men should have the right to vote. So let's role play this. I'm a group of people in England in the year 1200. Explain to me and convince me that all white men should have the right to vote. But first, explain to me what white people are, because I've never heard of white people before. So what are white people? 
How do you explain that to people who've never heard that concept? So if you go by skin tone, here's the thing, right? White people don't actually have white skin. Their skin is varying shades of beige, tan, brown, pink, and red. And if you go to China and Japan, Chinese and Japanese scholars have paler skin than European farmers. Many Europeans are farmers, they're working in the fields, they have rather dark skin. So if Chinese and Japanese scholars have paler skin than European farmers, why don't we call Chinese and Japanese people white people? Why don't we call white people pink people or tan people, <laughs> right? So what else could you tell people? You're talking to European farmers and they have brown skin. You might say, well, it's where you're from. It's European descent. That's how we typically think of white people today, people from Europe, Russia, right? If you told them, well, white people are people of European descent, English people, Irish people, the English would say, you want to put us in the same category as those subhuman Irish? <laughs> so keep in mind, the English had Irish slaves. And the English viewed the Irish as a separate subhuman race. And under English law, you could rape or murder an Irish person. And if you went to court and showed the judge the person was Irish, you would receive no punishment. So for most of European history, most Europeans saw other Europeans as subhuman in one way or another. This is why Europe has been the bloodiest continent in human history in terms of the frequency and duration of warfare culminating in two world wars. If you think that the Middle East and Africa are violent today, look at European history. So before World War, before World war I, the Germans and French didn't see each other as being the same race, as being as fully human as the other. And in World War I, there was an official propaganda poster depicting a German soldier as a gorilla. Today, we think of Germans as white people, but in World War I, many people saw the Germans as gorillas. Now, if you go back a thousand years before World War I, think about the Vikings. The Vikings were big-time slave traders. Where were the Vikings getting their slaves from? Were they getting most of their slaves from Africa? They were getting their slaves from Europe. They were enslaving what we today would call white people. Now, what would happen today if a British politician said that the Germans are subhuman? or a French politician said that all the Germans are subhuman, or a German politician said that all the French are subhuman? What would happen if a group in Denmark or Norway were sending ships around Europe today and kidnapping white people and selling them into slavery? What would happen if a national leader from any of those countries said that all Africans or all Asians are subhuman? The circle of who we consider part of the human family has never been as wide as it is today. Now that circle must get a lot larger Right? That circle isn't where it needs to be. And one thing I write about is dehumanization, how dehumanization restricts that circle and how we can resist dehumanization. But we've made progress, and we can and must make more progress. Now, if you do convince people back then that there's such a thing as white people, then they're going to say, well, doesn't God choose the king? So wouldn't democracy and voting go against the king and therefore go against God? Now today in the world, democracy is so popular in the world today that many dictatorships even try to create the illusion that they're democratic, whether through rigged elections or some other means of propaganda, right? That's why these countries have rigged elections, trying to create the illusion that they're democratic. And the question I want to pose to you is, have you ever wondered why you believe what you believe and why you think the way you think, right? Let's try another role-playing scenario. Imagine you go back in time to the year 1800, and you're talking to a class at Harvard in the year 1800, all men, and your mission, your purpose, is to convince them that all women should have the right to vote. So you'll role-play the person going back in time to the year 1800, and I'll role-play the Harvard class in the year 1800. Now, a few things to keep in mind. In the year 1800, women in America cannot vote, they can't own property, they can't go to college, they can't serve on a jury, and a man can legally beat and rape his wife. Also in the year 1800, many white men don't have the right to vote because there are certain property requirements. So in the year 1800, they have the idea of white people. But many people still don't believe that all white men should have the right to vote. Another thing to keep in mind is we don't have women's rights everywhere today. But wherever you find the lack of women's rights today, you will find a women's rights movement. Today, there is a women's rights movement in Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. 
If you go back 300 years, there was not a single women's rights movement anywhere in the world asking for full political, social, economic equality did not exist anywhere on the planet. 300 years ago, there wasn't a single women's rights movement in Europe asking for full equality. Now those movements are everywhere. So in 1800, women could not vote in any country on the planet. By 1970, women could vote in over 100 countries. Now, if you go back 200 years, many American women, probably most American women, did not believe that women should have the right to vote. There was a women's rights activist named Ernestine Rose, and she was doing a petition for women's right to own property in New York, and she had trouble getting a handful of women to sign this petition. So let's role play this. I'm a Harvard class in the year 1800. Try to convince me that all women should have the right to vote, and I might not even believe that all white men should have the right to vote. What do you tell me? I'm sure many of you believe this with conviction, right? So what could you tell me? Yes. We're just as smart as you are. <laughs> just as smart. Now that's a great point. Today we know it is a scientific fact that women are intellectually equal to men. But there was a myth back then. People believed that women are intellectually inferior to men. Very common myth. And people believed that because of women's intellectual inferiority, if you allow women to vote and own property and go to college, our society will collapse because women do not have the intellectual capacity to handle those responsibilities. So for example, look at Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin published a book in the 1870s, more than 70 years after 1800. And Charles Darwin published a book called The Descent of Man. And Charles Darwin said, obviously men are smarter than women. Charles Darwin said, look at the greatest achievements in any field, they're all men. Bach, Mozart, Copernicus, Galileo, Isaac Newton, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. If you go to the East, Lao Tzu, Buddha, Confucius, Sun Tzu, they're all men. Now keep in mind, women weren't allowed to do those things, for the most part. And we have had many brilliant women scientists, thinkers, artists, over the past several centuries. But even Charles Darwin believed this. Seventy years after 1800, even Charles Darwin believed this. Now, there was a professor at Harvard Medical School named Edward Clark. Professor at Harvard Medical School. He published a book in the 1870s. And Edward Clark said that when women study, it damages their health. And when women become educated, their ovaries don't develop and they can't reproduce. And that sounds funny to us today, but he was a professor at Harvard Medical School. And a question I want to pose to you is, what if there are things that we believe today that are going to sound funny in the future, right? Now today we know it is a scientific fact that women are not intellectually inferior to men. Scientific fact. Today in America, women graduate college at higher rates than men do. But even Edward Clark and Charles Darwin believed this close to the the 20th century, right? Later part of the 19th century, people still believe this. This is why it took so long for women in America to get the right to vote. What else could you tell people back then? What other argument could you use? Right. So if you say that women do an equal amount of work, they would say, well, their equal amount of work is in the home. Raising children, that's their role. If women are doing male jobs, which they don't have the intellectual capacity to do, but if they were doing those jobs, who's going to tend to the children? Who's going to take care of the home, right? These were the arguments people used, and people, these people weren't stupid back then, right? And I think we underestimate how people believed, yes. Queen Victoria thinks you're an idiot. Right. <laughs> right. So back then, they would compare female monarchs to male monarchs. They'd say, okay, compare Queen Victoria to Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar, who had more ability, right? That's how they would look at it back then. I don't agree with what they're saying, but I'm just trying to show that they had arguments that were able to convince most people, and it is remarkable that anything changed. And they would compare Caesar, Alexander the Great, they would compare these great military men or monarchs or kings to female monarchs and say, well, who has more capacity? Who conquered more? Alexander the Great or Queen Victoria? Right? Who built a greater empire? Right? Now, we know things are different today in terms of intellectual capacity, but we're going to tie this into some of our current problems later on. Let's try another role-playing scenario. 
Imagine you go back in time to the year 1600 in Spain or 1700 in England, and you're talking to a Christian church. You'll role play the time traveler, I'll role play the Christian congregation, and your mission is to convince them that slavery is always wrong, no exceptions. Now keep in mind, these people might literally try to kill you for saying this back then. Now, I do not know a single Christian today that advocates slavery. I do not know a single Christian today that advocates slavery. But if you go back to 1700, most Quakers weren't even against slavery in the year 1700. So let's be very clear that we define what state-sanctioned slavery was. State-sanctioned slavery wasn't just that you don't pay people. What state-sanctioned slavery meant was that I could murder you, I could tell everybody I killed you, I don't have to claim self-defense, and I receive no legal punishment. State-sanctioned slavery meant that people have no right to life. That's how you get people to work for free. Because I can basically tell you, look, if you don't work for free, I can torture and kill you. Everybody can know I did it, and no one's going to do anything to me. And if you run away from me, the police are going to bring you back to me. So what do you want to do? Do you want to work for free, or do you want me to torture and kill you? Now, they estimate that today there's around 27 million illegal slaves, still a problem, but it's less than 1% of the global population. If you go back to the 5th century BC in ancient Athens, around a third of the population were slaves. The 1st century BC in Rome, around a third of the population were slaves. If you look at the southern US states or Brazil or Cuba in the 19th century, around a third of the population were slaves. And we still have oppressive systems today. But if we have changed attitudes so dramatically about sanctioned slavery, why can't we change attitudes dramatically about other oppressive systems? If we have made some progress, why can't we make more progress? So let's role play this. But there is one way where this role playing is not going to be realistic. This role playing is not going to be realistic in the sense that if I'm role playing somebody who lived a few hundred years ago, and you told me slavery is wrong, I'm not going to throw anything at you, I'm not going to attack you, I'm not gonna to try to kill you. I'm gonna to try to keep it civil unlike how it would have been back then. Let's role play this. I'm a Christian church, Christian congregation a few hundred years ago in Europe. Try to convince me that slavery is always wrong, no exceptions. <laughs> so if you were to tell the Christians in Europe that God is a woman, Right. If you were to tell the rebelling Confederate states, don't have slaves, God's a woman, what would that do back then, right? Think about it. What would, would you say? Yes. Good point. Now, now keep in mind, there's no passage in the Bible that says all slavery is wrong. There are multiple Bible passages that condone slavery. But if you tell people well, we're all human, we all have a body, a mind, a heart, keep in mind, humans have this very dangerous ability to compartmentalize. Compartmentalizing is arguably one of our most dangerous human abilities. Compartmentalizing is where you divide people into different groups, where you say this group protect, this group, no mercy. If you hurt this group, you're evil. If you hurt this group, you're normal. So compartmentalizing is where the ancient Greeks could say, well, I shouldn't be a slave because I'm a Greek. I'm superior. But of course, these non-Greeks should be slaves. Or an English person could say, well, I shouldn't be a slave. I'm English. But of course, these Irish should be slaves. Or a Catholic could say, well, I shouldn't be killed. I'm a Catholic. But these Protestants, we should kill these Protestants. Or a Protestant can say, well, I shouldn't be a slave. I'm, I shouldn't be a slave or I shouldn't be killed. I'm a Protestant, but these Catholics, we should kill these Catholics. Or Hitler can say, well, I shouldn't be victim of a Holocaust because I'm an Aryan. But these Jews and gypsies, they should be killed in a Holocaust. We still do this today in our own culture. What are examples where in our own culture today, we still compartmentalize? We divide the different groups. This group protect, this group no mercy. What are examples where we do that still in the 21st century? Right? <laughs> Political divisions, 
Good point. Any other thoughts? The poor. How people view the poor. Good point. Now think about an example where the majority of peace activists compartmentalize. Now keep in mind, compartmentalizing, if you look at racism, sexism, genocide, war, slavery, you see this going on. If you look at all of our human social problems, you see this going on. But think about an example where the majority of peace activists compartmentalize. Think about an example where the majority of peace activists say, this group protect, this group no mercy. This group protect, this group kill them all, no mercy. If you hurt this group, you're wrong. If you think people shouldn't hurt this group, you're a little bit strange. Think about an example where most peace activists do this. So think about this. Have you ever wondered why in our society it's wrong to kill a dog, but it's not wrong to kill a pig? If scientifically speaking, dogs and pigs have the same emotional ability, the same emotional capacity, and if pigs are as smart, if not smarter than dogs, if pigs and dogs are both social, if pigs are at more social than cats actually, why is it wrong to kill a dog, but it's not wrong to kill a pig? If I showed you a video of my cute shelter dog that I adopted, and I showed you a video of me slitting my dog's throat, and I showed you a video of me eating my dog's legs, a lot of you wouldn't want to hear me talk anymore, right? <laughs> but what if I said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, my dog was humanely raised, free-range organic. I'm just trying to point out a contradiction. <laughs> now, let's not stereotype Asian people. I read an article in the Washington Post that said that 56% of people in China would support a law outlawing the eating of dog. My mother's Korean, she thinks eating dogs is terrible, especially many younger Koreans think eating dog is terrible. So things are changing. But I'm trying to point out a contradiction because when you compartmentalize, you don't realize you're doing it. Compartmentalizing is an unconscious process. Let's try another role-playing scenario. Imagine you go back in time to ancient Greece, the fifth century BC. And your mission, your purpose is to convince the ancient Greeks that they shouldn't sacrifice animals to the gods to make it rain and prevent natural disasters. Now keep in mind, every major agricultural civilization in history, at one point in their history, practiced animal sacrifice, human sacrifice, or both. In India, China, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, Rome, the, Ma the Aztecs and Mayan were sacrificing humans of the gods. And the Romans did not outlaw human sacrifice until 97 BC. So what do you tell people back then? What do you tell the Aztecs? Hey, Aztecs, you shouldn't be sacrificing people to the gods. I hope you can run fast. And keep in mind, people practiced this as government policy back then. What would happen today if an American politician said that the reason why we're having the drought in California and forest fires is because the gods are angry and we have to sacrifice a human being to please the gods? I don't know any government in the world that talks like that today. So what do you tell the ancient Greeks, the founders of Western democracy? What do you tell them, right? Now here's the point I want to make. The point I want to make is, what if we are just like those people? What if we are just like them? What if we are also very wrong, but about other issues? And what if people in the future are going to look at us, the way we look at people who supported slavery, the way we look at people who thought the Irish were subhuman, the way we look at people who practiced animal and human sacrifice? Would all of you agree that humans are fallible? We're not perfect. Anybody here disagree with that? Would all of you agree that humans have been wrong about all kinds of issues in the past? So don't you think that we might be wrong about some issues today? And can all of you imagine a future where people in the future do a role-playing scenario about our society? Where people in the future do a role-playing scenario about us? Can you imagine a future where people say, can you believe that in the 21st century, people used to wage war, and people used to dehumanize each other, and people used to have nuclear weapons? And can you believe that in the 21st century, people used to destroy their environment? And can you believe that in the 21st century, people used to eat animals? What were people thinking back then? 
Now, if any of that sounds strange to you, you have a better idea now of what it was like to be in a Harvard class in 1800 if somebody said all women should have the right to vote. Because these people at Harvard in 1800, they're not stupid people. They're not evil people, right? They have been conditioned to think a certain way by their society. And the challenge for us today is, can we have the vision to see beyond our own time period? Can we develop the vision to get out of that trap of how we've been conditioned to think and see beyond our own time period? That's our challenge today. And there were people in the past who were able to have the vision to see beyond their own time period. For example, Frederick Douglass, he was an escaped slave. In the 1840s, Frederick Douglass said that a woman should be allowed to have any job a man can have. Most American men did not believe that until the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. So Frederick Douglass was 140 years ahead of his time. You could even say he was ahead of our time. But Frederick Douglass had no formal education. He wasn't educated like Darwin. He wasn't a professor at Harvard like Edward Clark. But he was right about women and their potential. Edward Clark and Darwin were wrong. There was an abolitionist who said that Frederick Douglass graduated from the peculiar institution of slavery and his diploma was written on his back. Now, this does not mean that our views are arbitrary because there is such a thing as truth. It is a scientific fact that women are not intellectually inferior to men. It's a scientific fact that Irish people are not subhuman. It's a scientific fact that Africans are not subhuman. It's a scientific fact that earthquakes are caused by plate tectonics, not beside and shaking the ground with its trident. The Aztecs believe if they didn't sacrifice humans to the gods, they believe the world would end. It's a scientific fact the world will not end if we don't sacrifice humans to the gods. And there are scientific facts and truths about issues we're dealing with today that people don't realize that people in the future will see as common sense. And... You think about the ethical realities of war. Look at how ethics regarding slavery and women's rights have changed so dramatically. And could we be lacking critical understanding about the issues of war that is preventing us from seeing the ethical reality of what that system truly is and what the more practical alternatives are to that war system? So I want to talk about the issue that we're most unaware of today. And to talk about a parallel example where humans have been this unaware of an issue. I can't talk about women's rights a couple hundred years ago or slavery a few hundred years ago. I have to go back 3,000 years to offer a parallel example of where humans have been this unaware of an issue. So imagine if there was a high school anywhere in America today that had a 0% literacy rate. Imagine if there was a high school in America today where none of the students and none of the teachers knew how to read. Would that get national media attention? it probably get international media attention because today we have built our educational system and society around literacy. Now imagine going back 3,000 years to the Trojan War around 1100, 1200 BC and trying to convince the ancient Greeks and Trojans that they have, should have universal literacy. Back then the Greek and Trojan societies were almost completely illiterate. That's why none of the major characters in the Iliad know how to read. Not even the kings and princes in the Iliad know how to read. So imagine trying to convince the ancient Greeks and Trojans that they should have universal literacy. Would that be an easy or difficult thing to do? It'd be very difficult because they have no reference point for what reading is. And if you say, well, reading is a thing where you make marks and the marks make sounds, they'd say, well, what's the point of that? Why not just tell the person or send a messenger? Why go through all that trouble? Why not just tell the person or send a messenger? If you said, well, reading allows you to read books and letters, they'd say, what's a book? What's a letter? All right, they don't know what a book is. They don't know what a letter is. Now, if you're living in a small nomadic hunter-gatherer tribe, you don't need literacy. You don't need it. But when you're living in a large agricultural civilization, literacy becomes essential. That's why every major agricultural civilization in history reaches a point where they're trying to develop some kind of written language in Egypt, China, India, Mesopotamia, Greece, Rome. There were multiple written languages in the Americas. The Aztecs and Maya had written languages. So why is literacy so important? It might be the thing that we take most for granted today, but why is literacy so important? Anybody want to explain why literacy is so critically important, even though we take it for granted? Yes. You can capture the past, yes. Capture information. 
you can transmit knowledge to future generations. Any other thoughts? Communication, yes. Commerce, yes. Uh, record keeping, right? Literacy began initially as record keeping inventory. If you look at linear B, that was primarily inventory. But most people didn't know linear B in Greece. There are two bigger reasons that I don't hear people often mention. And I want to talk about those two larger reasons why literacy is so important. The first larger reason is not just distribution of information. The first larger reason is, as Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power. There's a reason why slave owners in America made it illegal for slaves to learn how to read. There's a reason why the Nazis burned books and why dictators banned books. There's a reason why Malala was shot in the head for trying to promote literacy and education for women. Because there's a reason why the Taliban does not want women to become educated. Because when you deny people education and literacy, you also deny them power. There's another larger reason why literacy is so important. Literacy is not just about distribution of information. Literacy gives us access to entirely new kinds of information. There are forms of information that you do not have access to unless you live in a literate society. One of these new forms of information is history. Without literacy, there is no such thing as history. And you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why do you need history? Why do you need literacy for history? The reason is because without literacy, you cannot separate history from mythology. So if you were to ask an ancient Greek 3,000 years ago, who's your ancestor? They might say, well, on my father's side, my great-great-great-grandfather was Zeus. And on my mother's side, my great-great-great-grandmother was Aphrodite. Do people talk like that today? Right? Do people today have gods in their family tree going back a few generations? If they do, it sounds very strange, right? And the ancient Greeks seem to have no historical memory that they used to be nomadic hunter-gatherers. According to their mythology, they had always lived in advanced agricultural civilization. So when they would look at nomadic hunter-gatherers, they'd say, well, these people must be barbarians. Who would live like this? Not realizing that they had once lived like that for countless generations. Another new form of information that literacy gives us access to is science. Every scientific field is possible because of the way that literacy allows us to organize and analyze information. So if you like electricity, then thank literacy. If you've ever benefited from antibiotics, thank literacy. Another new form of information that literacy gives us access to is every form of complex math. You can't have calculus without literacy, you can't have trigonometry, you can't have algebra. Every form of complex math requires literacy. Now, a better term for these people back then was not illiterate, because they weren't aware that they should know how to read. They weren't aware that they were missing crucial information, right? A better term for them is preliterate, because when you live in a preliterate society, you don't realize you're preliterate. Now, the point I want to make is what if all of us today in the 21st century are living in a preliterate society and we don't realize it? We're not preliterate in reading, we're preliterate in something else. What if we're living in a society that is preliterate in peace? And the reason why we have so many national problems and global problems and even personal and family problems is because our society is preliterate in peace. Literacy and reading gives you access to new kinds of information, history, science, complex math. Literacy and peace gives you access to new kinds of information, the solutions to our national and global problems. So I want to talk about peace literacy and how the world could be dramatically different if humans were peace literate. They estimate that today around 84% of people in the world are literate in reading, compared to less than 1% of people 3,000 years ago. But literacy and peace completely changes how we see human problems and the human condition and gives us new solutions to these problems. I want to talk about literacy in our shared humanity, which is one aspect of peace literacy. Literacy in our shared humanity. What does it mean to be human? What is the human condition? If you ask 100 different people what does it mean to be human, you probably get 100 different answers because we are not literate in our shared humanity. And I want to talk about this myth. If you look at Every injustice, they're always based upon a myth. The oppression of women is based upon the myth that women are intellectually inferior to men. If you don't refute that myth, you can't make progress. The slavery system is based upon the myth that these people are born to be slaves, they're happy being slaves, God made them to be slaves, and they're subhuman. If you do not refute that myth, you can't make progress, right? Animal sacrifice, human sacrifice is based upon 
a myth of what causes problems, natural disasters, war, famine, plague. Um, if you look at any injustice, right, if you look at the myth that gay people, they aren't born gay, right? That, that a person cannot be born gay, they always choose to be gay, and if they are born gay, they can be cured of being gay, right? If people can be born gay, then gay rights becomes a human rights issue. If nobody's born gay, then it's not as much a human rights issue. But the war system is based upon several myths. The first myth is that humans are naturally violent. Another myth is that war makes us safe. And another myth is that war is inevitable. And I want to talk about this myth that humans are naturally violent. What I mean by that is if anybody gets cancer or malaria or HIV or Ebola, I've never heard anybody say, oh, that's human nature, right? People realize something has gone wrong. But if people are become violent, people often say, oh, that's human nature, we have to bomb people. Now, the point I want to make is that there are many sick people around the world, people who are physically sick, and there are parts of the world where most of the people are sick. There have been populations where a plague infected most of the population and killed a third to a half of the population. But are humans supposed to get the plague? Are we supposed to be sick? Does that help or harm our survival, right? And when people are violent, are we supposed to be violent? Or does violence occur when something has gone wrong, like an illness, where just as illnesses have preventable causes, violence also has preventable causes? If you go back to the 12th century in Europe, Europeans did not know what caused illnesses and plague. They thought plague was being caused by God or the planets or some other reason that wasn't accurate. And today, we view the illness of violence the way that people in medieval Europe viewed physical illness. People back then didn't have microscopes. They didn't know what viruses were. They didn't understand why these things were happening. And most people today do not understand why violence happens. They don't understand the causes. And just as medieval Europeans would have solutions that would make the problem worse, we have solutions that actually make violence worse because we don't understand the real causes of this problem. So I just want to talk briefly about the myth that humans are naturally violent. I could spend hours refuting every single misconception. If we had time, every misconception can be refuted convincingly. I just want to offer a couple things to think about. And I want to begin with a question. What does war do to the human mind? What does prolonged exposure to war do to the human brain? So what does war do to the human mind? Causes trauma, right? War causes trauma. War traumatizes the brain. This is so non-controversial today that today even pro-war people say that war is hell. But here's the thing. If human beings were naturally violent, why would war traumatize the human brain? If people were naturally violent, wouldn't people go to war and become more mentally healthy? But the opposite happens. If you raise a child in a violent, abusive environment that is not good for the human brain, that is not good for human development, scientific fact. If you raise a child in a peaceful, loving environment that is good for the human brain, that is good for human development, scientific fact. But if we were naturally violent, why wouldn't the opposite be true? So there were two army medical doctors named Swank and Marchand. And they were in World War II. And they did a study that found that after 60 days of sustained day and night combat, 98% of soldiers suffer psychiatric trauma. But 2% of soldiers can be exposed to war for long periods of time and kill and kill and kill and never go insane. So why is that 2% different? Why can 2% of soldiers be exposed to war for long periods of time and never go insane? And why can the other 98% not do that? Why does 98% suffer trauma after 60 days of continual day and night combat, and why does 2% never go insane? The reason why that 2% is never driven insane by war, according to the study, is because they were already insane before they went to war. <laughs> according to the study, that 2% is composed primarily of aggressive psychopaths. Primar primarily of aggressive psychopaths. But if we were naturally violent, why wouldn't you have the opposite proportion? That's why the military does, today does combat rotations and gives soldiers days off in between because of the impact of continual day and night, nonstop combat, how it breaks down the human mind. 
Now, here's what we have to understand about violence and trauma. In all of human history, in all of human history, there has never been a single recorded instance, not one recorded instance of a human being becoming traumatized from receiving a genuine act of kindness. <laughs> never before happened. But if you receive an act of violence against your will, it'll traumatize you, maybe severely. And you might say, well, that's because violence causes physical injury. But in all of human history, there's never been a single recorded instance of a human being becoming traumatized from inflicting a genuine act of kindness. But many, many people become traumatized from inflicting violence. Even if you receive no physical injury in the process, you can be traumatized from inflicting violence. Now, if kindness doesn't traumatize us, and violence does traumatize us, does that mean that humans are supposed to be kind to each other? More so, violence is arguably the most traumatic thing a human being can go through, violence from another human being. Kindness is arguably one of the most pleasant things we can go through, somebody being kind to us. Does that mean that humans are supposed to be kind and not supposed to be violent to each other because violence causes so much trauma to the human brain? Now, all of you understand how you can be traumatized from inflicting violence? Let me do a thought experiment to show how you can be traumatized from inflicting violence. Imagine if I had you spend an entire day with a five-year-old girl, and your mission during this day is to get to know this five-year-old girl as well as possible. Find out what she wanna be when she grows up. What are her parents like? What are her siblings like? Does she have a pet? What's her pet's name? Um, what's her favorite game? And then go to the park, get to know this five-year-old girl as well as possible. Now, at the end of this day, I want you to look the five-year-old girl in the eyes, and without blinking or turning your head, I want you to take a hammer and bash her skull in. Around 98% of the human population will become traumatized from inflicting that intimate act of violence. But what if you don't spend the entire day with the girl? What if you know nothing about her? And then you kill her. The percentage of people traumatized will decrease slightly. What if you never see her face? What if you hit her in the back of the head with a hammer? The percentage of people traumatized will decrease slightly. What if you don't use a hammer? What if you shoot her with a rifle at 300 yards? The percentage of people traumatized will decrease. What if you believe she's evil, or you believe her family's evil, or you believe her family's subhuman, or you believe that her family wants to kill your family? Percentage of people traumatized goes way down. What if you drop bombs at 10,000 feet? percentage of people traumatized goes way down. So the war system is able to create all these forms of distance to reduce the amount of people traumatized. Now, I'm not saying that people can't become violent. Uh, my father fought in the Korean and Vietnam wars. He had a lot of war trauma. I grew up in a very violent household. And I grew up with all kinds of behavioral problems. I got kicked out of elementary school for fighting. I almost got kicked out of middle school. I got suspended in high school for fighting. And what got me interested in peace was I realized if it, I do not figure out how to heal this trauma, I'm eventually going to murder somebody. I just could not control how angry I would get. I did not get angry the way most people would get angry. So for me, my interest in peace was initially the search for inner peace, how to calm my trauma, how to calm my rage. And people can become extremely violent. I understand why people do these things. But I wasn't born like that. I wasn't supposed to be fantasizing about killing people all the time. Something had gone wrong in my development that I had to fix within myself, right? It was like illness. And I've had to put a lot of work into understanding rage, calming my rage, and it's been a difficult struggle, but this is the reality of, of what's going on in the world, why people can do incredibly horrible things that people can't even understand. And I don't condone those things, but I understand how intoxicating rage can be. How, how, how rage can, can, it's beyond what a lot of people who've never felt that rage can really um, know in terms of how it completely changes how you see reality. So I wanna talk about one more aspect of our shared humanity. And this will also give you a tool that you can use in your life. So I have to tell a story to talk about this aspect of our shared humanity. 
So I have one friend I still talk to from high school. He and I went to high school in Alabama. He still lives in Alabama. And I went to visit him a few summers ago in Alabama where he still lives. And I arrived there on a Friday, Friday evening. Him and his friends wanted to go out drinking that evening. I don't drink any alcohol, but I went out with him anyway just to be social. And at around 2 in the morning, they all wanted to go to a Waffle House. Everybody was drunk, and in Alabama, that's where drunk people go at 2 in the morning when they're hungry. <laughs> so we go to this Waffle House at 2 in the morning. I'm probably the only person at the Waffle House who isn't drunk, other than the workers. And there's a guy in the corner screaming at this waitress. He's screaming at this waitress because she just brought him his food, and he has a dirty fork. And he's screaming at her, my fork's dirty, my fork's dirty, give me a clean fork, I want a clean fork. She doesn't have a clean fork for him immediately, so he walks across the Waffle House, takes my fork out right in front of me, goes back, sits down, starts eating. So I'm looking at the menu, I haven't ordered my food yet. The waitress saw what happened. Within 30 seconds, she gave me a brand new fork, so I'm not too worried about it. So my friend's friend is sitting next to me, and he gets really, really angry. He goes, that guy just took your fork. And I go, yeah, but now he has a fork, I have a fork, everybody has forks. <laughs> Everything's fine. So my friend's friend is getting angrier, angrier, angrier. I said, look, I appreciate you trying to defend my honor, <laughs> but the guy didn't take my wallet. If he took my wallet, I'd have to get my wallet back. And what he did was wrong. He shouldn't have taken my fork. But when people are drunk, they make bad decisions, and you can't reason with them. So he was over there minding his own business. He didn't take my wallet. He's really drunk. I think we should just leave him alone. So my friend Fred is getting angrier, angrier, angrier. Finally, he goes, I'm not going to take this. He goes, he starts screaming in the guy's face. He goes, he's a veteran. You can't take his fork. So I haven't drunk any alcohol, so I'm looking at everything very rationally. And first of all, the guy who took my fork is physically massive. <laughs> very large, muscular human being. And I've done martial arts for a long time. Martial arts teaches just because people are big doesn't mean they can fight, but it is something to think about. <laughs> And it's a very dangerous situation. There's four men. They're all large men. The guy sitting next to the guy who took my fork, the guy sitting next to him has this big chain around his neck, like a Home Depot chain. <laughs> so I realize there's about to be a fight. I go over there. I calm everything down. I bring my friend's friend back. And the guy with the chain comes over and apologizes. He goes, I'm really sorry. My friend's drunk, doesn't know what he's doing. Let me apologize by paying for your meal. He actually paid for my meal to apologize for his friend. Now, the reason I tell you that story is because there was almost a mini war started just over people feeling disrespected. That's all that that was about. Everybody had food. Everybody had forks. Right? <laughs> Nobody's personal property was taken. That was all about people feeling disrespected. My friend's friend was disrespected because my fork was taken, and I'm a veteran. And that guy was disrespected because he's being yelled at and because he had a dirty fork. Now, there is a reason why martial arts teaches you to always respect everybody, including your opponent. The reason why martial arts teaches you to always respect everybody, including your opponent, is because the vast majority of human conflict comes from people just feeling disrespected. That is what causes most human conflict, is people feeling disrespected, violated by another human in some way. Later on tonight, reflect upon your life. Think about all the times in your life when you most wanted to yell at somebody or punch somebody. It's probably because you felt disrespected in some way. This applies to the personal level. This applies also to the international level. Now, martial arts teaches the best self-defense isn't punching or kicking. The best self-defense is to go through life conveying respect to everybody. If you convey respect to everybody, you not only dramatically reduce conflict in your life, but when you do have conflict, which you will eventually, you dramatically improve your ability to resolve conflict. This is why we admire people like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Wangari Maathai, Malala. They respect everybody, even their adversary. 
Nelson Mandela even respected his prison guard. If Nelson Mandela had hated his prison guard, would we admire him the way that we do? If Malala said that she wishes she could torture and kill the people who tried to kill her, would we admire her? That is how they get their moral authority. They get their moral authority from their ability to convey respect. Now, how do you convey respect? I was never taught this as a child. This goes back to literacy in our shared humanity. This is part of the human condition. And some people learn this from their parents, but many people learn very bad habits from their parents. And how often do you turn on television and see people on television res resolve conflict in a peaceful, loving way? So how do you convey respect? There's different cultural norms between cultures, but there are a few things that every culture finds respectful. I just want to discuss one thing that every culture finds respectful. This is universally true in human history 3,000 years ago, 300 years ago, a thousand years from now, if humans are still here, this will be true. Every culture in human history finds listening respectful. Every culture finds not listening disrespectful. Think of it like this. In all of human history, I don't think anyone has ever seriously said, I hate it when people listen to me. I can't stand it when people listen to me. <laughs> Nobody ever says, me and my spouse have to go to marriage counseling. My spouse listens to me all the time. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> does, anybody here not, does anybody here not like to be listened to? Raise your hand if you hate it when people listen to you. Raise your hand if you don't like to be listened to. Now, the key to listening is empathy. If you don't have empathy for people, you can't really hear what they're saying. If you don't have empathy for people, you can hear their words, but you can't hear their hopes, you can't hear their fears, you can't hear their humanity. So the key to listening is empathy. And if we were to increase peace literacy, if we were to debunk these myths about the human condition and violence, we could open the way to ending politically organized violence between nations. There might still be murder, assault, we could reduce that, but if we were able to refute these myths and increase peace literacy, this world could be dramatically different. Go back to the beginning of the talk, that's how I want to end is by going back to the beginning and think about all the examples of change I mentioned, how differently people see slavery and human sacrifice, the Irish, Attitudes that have changed so dramatically, many people today don't even remember how different things used to be. And I want to point out that the issues we're dealing with now threaten human survival. Women's rights, ending slavery, as important as those issues were, they didn't threaten human survival. But the issues we're dealing with now, war, environmental destruction, nuclear weapons, threaten human survival. And so far through history, the truth has prevailed. But the question today is, will the truth prevail in time? Will the truth prevail before we destroy and destabilize our delicate biosphere, which makes complex life on Earth possible? So I want you to imagine two possible futures. The first possible future is that 500 years from now, people look back upon us and they say, can you believe that people in the 21st century used to wage war and people in the 21st century used to have nuclear weapons and people in the 21st century used to destroy their environment? What were people thinking back then? But in a way, those people in the future are proud of us because we made the changes necessary for them to have a future. If they are there, that means that we had the vision to see beyond their own time period. And in that way, those people are proud of what we accomplished for them. The second possible future is that 500 years from now, there are no humans to look back because humanity has gone extinct, most life on the planet has gone extinct, and the world is in ruin. So we have to wage peace and work together to ensure that that first possible future becomes a reality. Thank you.